So once again, uh, thank you, Khaki, for this gentle push towards uh, this new medium and for going a little beyond Sobo, a little bit about the title. Those of us who are indigenous to coastal settlements on the west coast of peninsula India, we realize we've been culturally shaped both by geography and by history. Now, Thani's historic, perhaps cataclysmic changes have come not just with the flow of the tide, but also its ebb. And that's why this title is called The Tides of History. The high tide brought in ships that crossed the seas. The ebb in April 1737 brought the Peshwa's army to take the Portuguese fort that lay at the water's edge to be one of the first victories of a local power over the Europeans. Yeah. So let's uh, well, let's begin then. Yeah. What is maritime history? Just let's go back to that. It's the human engagement with the sea, either through economic activity like trade or shipbuilding or manufacture, explorations and discoveries, even conflict, including pirate activity or naval warfare. Now, if you want to talk about pirates, that's a whole new story altogether, and we are not getting into that today. I just want to spend a little time uh, talking about how ports can be centers of civilization. Um, Tani was a port settlement, like many others, and considered centers of the civilized world. Why? Because they boasted of multiracial, multi-religious, multicultural populations. People of other lands lived here, as elsewhere in the Konkan, enriching the indigenous population and themselves through trade. They altered the architectural landscape and added to the cultural diversity that characterizes this region. I just want to spend a little time telling you about Fernand Brodel's uh, study of uh, Indonesia, and it applies so beautifully to many of our coastal, west coastal uh, cities and uh, kingdoms. Despite all the kings and sultans who ruled them and maintained order there, these were virtually autonomous towns, wide open to the outside world. They could orient themselves to suit the currents of trade. And I think this has a great meaning for, for many of us who live on the west coast of India. I'm losing myself. Uh, now, um, this map here shows you all the ports that you can see. You can see how many there were all along the west coast of India. And I just want to draw your attention to two things. There are some ports that are on, there are some ports that are on the uh, coast there are some ports that are slightly inland. Tana is what they call a tidal, on the tidal held, head. It's, uh, 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 sorry, a tide, uh, Tana was on the midstream. The tidal head in our case is Kalyan, Bivandi, and perhaps even Sopara. And all these three were uh, very famous ports in ancient times. But as we go uh, ahead in time, we come to uh, uh, other ports which became important. Look at this picture of Kalyan. And very frankly, those of us who've gone past this area would imagine, would, could see this scene till pretty recently. The image is labeled Kalyan, Kalyan. Notice the sal salt mounds here and the tiny little boats and the bigger boats. And uh, uh, if you have ever uh, gone to Nashik via Kalyan, you will know that uh, you can reach, uh, or even if you have driven to uh, Nanighat, you can reach there within an hour. So Kalyan is at the tidal head on the ancient trade routes to the mountains, to Pratishthan, that's modern Paithan, which was the capital of the Satavanha Park in ancient times. But as we uh, come uh, towards the medieval period, uh, you have 
uh, other ports uh, that come springing up and uh, Tana's, uh, let's say, prominence came between the 9th to the 14th centuries. And uh, later on, of course, Vasai or Basin and Bombay or Mumbai commanded maritime traffic and rose to prominence. Bombay, now Mumbai, retains its premier position with all the other stations acting as dormitory towns as best. Okay, so enough of that uh, background. I've got this map over here and you can see the, the creek now petering out into a very fine stream and it goes all the way. Can you see the, the, the mouse? It goes all the way here to Kalyan. There's Bhivandi there. Of course, these maps don't always. And then you can have a host of other towns like Ambarnath, Dombivli, Navi Mumbai. All these came up later. But this was the highway. I consider the Thani Creek to be a sort of a highway. It not only went towards Kalyan, but it also went westwards and came to Vasai here. And if it went southwards, it came to Mumbai and then the open sea. Okay, James Douglas uh, painted a very vivid picture. He says, a creek fringed with cactus and palm up to which twice a day the tide rushes in with remarkable velocity, converting its dry and rocky bed into the dimensions of a navigable, navigable river. And then the creek widens out uh, gradually into an estuary, now the harbor of Bombay and beyond the illimitable sea. Just to um, uh, sort of put a little outline, so we have uh, the earliest name of Thana being Sri Sthanaka. Uh, it, it finds mention along with Kalyan uh, as market towns by classical writers. It was a port frequented by Arab tra traders. It was visited by Marco Polo. Very few people know this. It was a textile manufacturing center. I'll be talking a little bit about that a little later. Uh, it was a Portuguese settlement. It was an administrative subdivision of the Portuguese Provincia del North. It was um, the strategic control of the waterway connecting Thane, Basim, Thane, Kalyan, Thane, Bombay and several naval engagements changed history. It was a center of boat building. I'll talk a little bit about that. Silk weaving, very few people know about this, and even woodwork. Okay, here is a very old picture. You must have seen this before in other uh, presentations. It's of a hero stone that's found at Ixar, that's at Burivli. And it definitely shows a naval battle in progress. It's quite eroded now, but nevertheless, um, it, it, it tells us that naval battles were fought. Now, what are some of these naval battles around Thani that changed history? 1246, and these are recorded. The Shilahara Yadava battle, 12, 1428, Sultan of Gujarat versus the Bahamani Sultan. Then uh, Thana and Mahim came under Gujarat. 1528, Tana was first attacked by the Portuguese naval forces. Uh, 1722, uh, the English attacked the river fort. 1737, the Maratha attacked on uh, attack on Tana. And 1774, uh, till uh, independence, you have the English uh, in Tana. Okay. The earliest reference to Thana comes from Arab sources that write of a raid party sent by Usman bin Sarkifi, the governor of Bahrain and Oman, who landed at Thana in uh, the 7th century. Go a little quicker now. Of course, this picture is of the, uh, an Arab Dhau, but it's of the East Coast. And you can see very sweetly, you can see the horses here in the hold and all the men up there. But this is an East Coast painting. Now, uh, this is a picture taken maybe in the 1980s or 70s, yes, perhaps, in Thana. It shows the famous Masunda Talao. Uh, here you have the Gatkari Rangayatan, which is a, a theater. And I want you to notice the stone 
edge that you have over here. Now, the Shilaharas of Tana flourished between 800 of the current era till about 1240 of the current era. It was called Sri Sthanaka, the settlement. It thrived on trade and manufacture. And the Shilahara rulers themselves uh, reap revenue from toll and toll duties on carts entering the city. A copper plate grant exempts the carts of the great minister, Habdrat Sheshti and his brother. It's obvious that the ruling uh, parties and the ruling elite participated in trade. Uh, the, uh, the Portuguese talk about the stone-lined water tanks like the Masunda that you see over here, which most probably uh, date to the Shilahara period. Marco Polo, the great Venetian traveler, uh, he specifically mentions that no pepper grows here, nor other spices, but plenty of incense, not of the white kind, but of brown. Um, I checked this out with uh, the botany department in college and they said, oh yes, there, you know, mostly incense, you have many different kinds depending, uh, because incense comes from the sap of the tree, which hardens and when you burn it, it has that fragrance. So yes, brown incense is very much from a produce, uh, the produce of trees that could be found in the locality. Uh, it's nice to have uh, confirmation of some of these uh, old records with uh, what, what is found in uh, the environment today. Uh, Marco Polo goes on to talk about the great export of leather and good buckram. So I think this is one of the earliest references that we have to Tana's textile trade. And uh, the merchants uh, in their ships also import various articles such as gold, silver, copper, and other things in demand. Marco Polo also talks about the pirates and he says the king is hand in glove with the pirates. Yeah, here's a map which shows you his first his overland route to China and on the way back his sea route where he comes this way and then returns to Europe. Lots of other travelers have made their uh, uh, way uh, to Tana and the West Coast and we have a whole list of them over here. It's very interesting to read because you get a clearer picture, not only, um, it's not just political history that we uh, can find out, but we, we know about the economy, we know about the trees. Of course, sometimes they exaggerate and talk about um, cats as big as, rats as big as dogs and whatever else, but uh, we can leave that aside. Um, I, I found this picture and was given to me by... Uh, it was in the exhibition at uh, CSMVS. Um, and I thought to myself, this really must have been what Tana must have been like, you know, a riverside port, you have the buildings there, you have this uh, uh, sloping landing place, you have the little crowded boats, you have the bigger boats, you have the smaller boats uh, bringing passengers, the bigger boats carrying goods. So... Uh, and if this is painted in 15, in the middle of the uh, 16th and 17th centuries, you can also see that. I also want to draw your attention uh, to how um, something written in 1321 can be witnessed today. Okay. Now, Friar Oderick, who came uh, to India in 1321, says, In this country, men make use of a kind of vessel which they call jars. Could it be jahaz? which is fastened only with a stitching of twine. Now these, if you can look at this picture clearly here, you can see the rope stitching this plank to this plank. So they use no iron, no nails, and that helps the, the boats uh, survive uh, without getting, uh, springing a leak, without the nails getting rusted. And uh, people from, uh, foreign countries were fascinated. I was lucky to have got this picture of this boat uh, taken, um, you know, along the Ratnagiri coast. Um, unfortunately, when I sent someone very recently to take more pictures, he said they've stopped using these boats. So I'm glad at least we got this picture. Yeah. Friar Oderick came to Thana and he took back 
the bones of these four Christian monks on, uh, who were on their way to, uh, to China. That's what I talk about, how the tide affects history. So they were on their way to China. They were, they, they were put ashore at, at Tana. And there they found 15 Christian families. But to those many people who think that Christianity came to India, you know, with the colonial powers, there is ample evidence of small Christian communities living right down the west coast of India. And this is a detailed um, uh, story about one such community of 15 Christian families. Of course, the monks were arguing with the local administration and uh, they met their end like this. But that's another story altogether. Um, I know this is a lot of text, but it gives you such a clear picture of Tana in the 16th century. Uh, very few of us know what life was like, but here you have a detailed uh, description. I, I'm going to quickly read. It had sovereignty over many lands, and one part of Gujarat was subject to it and lived under its laws. The city is built on the banks of the river, which runs between the island of Salset and the continent, and goes past Basain. It measures along with its suburb less than a league, five kilometers in length, and half in breadth. Uh, this is important. In the city were 60 very magnificent mosques and 60 tanks, some of which are two-thirds the Rusio of Lisboa. The Rusio is the main square in downtown Lisboa, Lisbon, and it's huge. So you can imagine how huge. I think he's talking about the Masunda Talao. What you see of the Masunda today is, is half its size because the roads have been carved out on every side of the Masunda with, uh, with uh, landfills. Uh, the, the tanks were marked marvelously in stone with many steps ascending and descending like a theater. Such a picture, you can imagine it. And in some parts are recreational houses. Workmanship of the houses and buildings of the city was notable as some of the bricks were fitted together without lime and fitted so well, leaving no crevices. Some were made of very well-dressed stone and fitted, especially the brickwork. You know, it's just that uh, we can't believe everything that he says because he says, he takes this number 60. Everything is 60, 60 tanks, 60 mosques. So we just imagine that uh, it is the number of villages traditionally associated with the island of Salset, which perhaps derived its name from Sashast. Okay, here is a selection of maps showing the Portuguese settlement of Tana. I'll go quickly through this. Um, I want you to, this is a detail of a map of Tana in 1635. And if you look at the next slide, this is the detail, it's high up on the altar, perhaps you, because it's, the picture is blown up, you can see it. Look at these houses here, very much like what you saw in the previous slide. And though this is supposed to depict Christ's crucifixion, the houses look very much the white houses with the red tile roofs could very much have been like the houses that you have in medieval Tana. So you have not just a description, but also a visual representation of them. Uh, this is also a very interesting map. It's of the map of the island of Bombay. It shows uh, the Bombay fort here. It shows Malabar Hill. It shows Verdley. It shows uh, Vasova, and this is Salset Island. It shows Bhandup. It shows uh, Manapaser, which is the Mount Poisa, Budifli. It shows Thana. Um, it shows the creek. It shows the sandbanks. So it's, it's very interesting to see all these little things, though the map may not be of, of, up to scale. Here is another map, and this one shows the towers for the defense of the waterway. Uh, what we must understand is that the Portuguese were hardly uh, land, uh, hardly interested in, the, in conquering territories on the land. 
they were more interested in controlling the waterways. They were more interested in controlling the trade. So whenever they found a city, whenever they found a place that was industrialized, they tried to uh, keep hold of it because it would help them in their trade. And uh, at the same time, they did all they could to protect it. So you have um, here one tower in the middle of the creek and you have another tower here, a watch kind of watch come defensive tower. And then further up you have, uh, according to the sources, five other small towers that uh, would protect this waterway. This waterway, as we have seen in the previous slide, connects up to Basain, which was their capital. It connects to Kalyan, the hinterland, so they could get their produce from there. It connects up to Bhivandi. So it's a very, very important waterway, especially in full tide. Here's Bandura. Um, uh, and here there are other uh, watchtowers, most probably Mud. Mud Island had a, a Portuguese uh, uh, watchtower and to settlement. Now, I know this is a, a little uh, a bit of text, but here is a description of Thana, and a, a translation of this is here. It says the settlement of Thana is on the island of Salset of Basai, four leagues from the set Fortaleza, and it has 180 dwellers, whites and blacks, with many slaves called to arms. Uh, the settlement has its captain, etc., etc., a church with a vicar and another parish which is called St. John. We still have the parish of St. John's. There's four convents, Augustinians, Dominicans, the Capuchin, uh, Capuchins or the Franciscans. In this settlement are many textiles. Now, this is what interests me very much. <clears throat> because this textile trade lasts right up to the uh, 20th century and was only affected by the Industrial uh, Revolution. So you have gingems, taffetas, writing desks, which are made here in black wood and are the most durable and best in India. Then he talks about the bulwark of the river, which goes to Bombay by the name of Reish Magus, the one that you saw. Bandora is a settlement in the jurisdiction of Basai, with a fort, is close to Tana with its commander and 50 dwellers. Okay, I will talk more about the textiles and gingems a little later. This is a, a close-up of the map that you just saw. Once again, you see Bandura there. You see Tana here. Uh, this is the 1635 uh, map. The many copies. So you'll see it's the same map in different libraries um, of uh, Europe. You'll find them in the same map, copies of which are there in Lisbon, in Madrid, in others. Uh, this was a sketch that I made for my thesis uh, from an old map uh, of 1737, uh, uh, little before that. It's a sketch of the cit citadel. And if you see this Google image, it's almost exactly like the sketch that you saw a little earlier. So here are the arrowhead bastions. If you want to make out which is the Portuguese fort, you just have to look for the arrowhead bastions. Because for them, uh, these bastions were easily the best uh, for attack and for defense. Uh, today, this is the, by the way, today, this is the central jail. In the middle over here, you have what is called the Anda cell. All the buildings of the fort were cleared by the British and they made it into a jail. I had the privilege of going into this jail just once, of course, not for myself, but uh, I was, the jailer was kind enough to take me there and I climbed up to this, this top of this Anda cell so I could see all around. I want you to notice this round bastion here. Now, this is the addition uh, that came up during the time of the Marathas. Uh, the Marathas used their own ingenuity, their own uh, engineering skills 
but uh, they had round bastions. So whenever you see round bastions, you, you should know that it is an indigenous fort. When you see uh, arrowhead bastions like this, you should know it is a Portuguese fort. The water of the creek came right up to here. Today, all this is silted up and landfilled and there's a road. So the, the, the fort no longer stands by the uh, creek. I also want to draw your attention to this other talao here. It's called the Dewala. We'll see it again. We call it the Jail Talao, but its actual name is the Dewala. Um, Sid Mendirata says, the round bastions built by the Marathas in the two southern bulma bulwarks um, attest the singular approach of the Maratha engineers adapting a pre-existing structure to their own military uh, traditions and concerns. Here's another old picture showing you uh, the round bastion. Uh, today, they won't even allow you to go up to this point because it's become a high security uh, central jail. Um, uh, uh, after the Portuguese, uh, uh, I mean, uh, after the Marathas took over from the Portuguese in 1737, uh, you have the English who were waiting in Bombay, waiting to get hold of the whole island of Salset. And so, in 1774, and uh, those of you who go to St. Thomas's Cathedral in South Bombay, you will see this little memorial here. And the memorial is to John Watson, who was uh, mortally wounded, apparently shrapnel. He died because there was a whole lot of shrap shrapnel that, that uh, made him bleed and he died. Um, and this is his memorial in the St. Thomas's Cathedral. So now you have Tana going over to the English. Here is another view of Tana Fort. And this time, if you look very closely, you can see the British flag, the English flag over the tower. You still see buildings here. A lot of them, two of them are churches, which uh, were left over from the Portuguese times. In time, they cleared these buildings and uh, made, converted it into a jail. Uh, this is a beautiful uh, view of uh, one of the landings. Very interesting because you see the circular bastion of the fort here. You see a ruined watchtower here. And this was uh, in um, 1851. So coming into the 19th century. You see people over here waiting for their boat. You can see uh, even in my childhood we saw boats like this. Uh, the sailboats going down the river, uh, not anymore. Now, uh, any maritime um, history has to talk about landings. And in 1882, there were reportedly four landings, uh, or bandars, Mandui. Now, those of us who know, the Mandui is usually where the customs house is. We have, Man there's Mandui in Bombay, there's Mandui in Goa, and Mandui, you'll find at many, many port cities, port settlements. So uh, it usually refers to the place where there were landings. Then there's Liberi and there's Bendi at Mahagiri. Mahagiri is still a very, very important old part of Thana, really worth exploring with two ancient mosques. And, and then you have Chendani to the south of the railway line, which was formerly a um, uh, one of the Kolivadas. Sadly, Chendani is now divided into two by the railway line and further uh, uh, sort of uh, cut up because of the line that goes to Panvel. So the Fisher, uh, the Koli colony, the Kolivada has really been uh, split into two and that's uh, and, they put, and the Kolivadas have been pushed to the edge, like in many other parts of the city of Bombay. Another very important thing is uh, uh, Tana is called the city of lakes. Of the eight lakes and reservoirs in Salt Set, 
recorded in the revision survey of the Bombay government in 1897. Six were to be found in, in Tana. Masunda, we call it Talaupali. You, you saw it in the previous picture. Uh, Atala or Devala, I, I'll show it to you again. This is near the jail. Gosala, this is near the Holy Cross convent. It's a little small. Hariala, this is the one in uh, Chendani, which is near, very close to the railway station. If you're at the railway station, you'll see it. And these four are even shown in maps of the Portuguese, all these four. Then you have Makmali, which is on the old Bombay Agra Road. You have Siddeshwar near Kopat. And you have Pokhran, which supplied water to the city. And it was uh, commissioned as late as, this was by the British in 1880. There are many others. This is a very old picture of the Devala Talao. You'll see uh, St. James's Church here with its steeple. This is uh, the Protestant church. And uh, till very recently, you could see the stone sides of the Devala. But it's very picturesque because, uh, you know, it, it belongs, the whole property around that belongs to the jail authorities. And so there are no, there were new, no new buildings. I can't say the same now. Um, uh, Salset no longer remains an island because in 1863, this 350 meter bridge was built, which linked Thana and Kalva and uh, Mumbai to the continent, what they call the continent. Um, but most writers say that the pass at Thana was the key to the continent, according to Gross. Here's another picture of the old and uh, new Thana. The new Kalva Bridge. This is the new Kalva Bridge. This is the old Kalva Bridge. And look at the filth and the silk in between. Now, uh, I said some time ago that uh, we talked about uh, these port cities on the west coast of India being centers of civilization. Uh, this is very interesting that you have six world uh, religions have their houses of worship within walking distance of each other. This is very, very interesting. Okay, so here you have the Kopineshwar temple hmm? and the church of St. John the Baptist overlooks and you can see the temple and the temple can see the church and then you, this is the Jambli Naka circle and you go down this road and just over here you have uh, an Ikyari. When you cross the Tembinaka, you go a little further and you have the Jain temple. Then you go a little further at this corner and you have a Jewish synagogue. And, and within a stone's throw of the Jewish synagogue, you have the Tembi mosque. Each of these places has very, very interesting stories to tell. Okay, here's a modern map showing you Here's Talaupali, Kopineshwar, St. John the Baptist, Kawasji Patel Agyari. The Jain temple should be here, Gate of Heaven Synagogue, and the Tembi Masjid. And here is the same Deva, uh, Devala Talao that we saw earlier, besides other Talaos. The Kopineshwar Mandir was built by Ramji Mahadev Bhivalkar, the Sats of Thana, around 1760. That's about 30 odd years after it had captured Thana. It is uh, 20, yeah. It's home to one of the biggest Shiva Lingas of Maharashtra. Here's a, a picture of the interior and the exterior of the Kopineshwar Mandir. Um, till, um, let's say, our parents' uh, lifetimes, the waters of the Talao Pali bathed the steps of the Kopineshwar Mandir. Not anymore because the road has been carved out to reach the station. 
uh, in an almost forgotten corner of this complex stands a um, in the same complex, you have other small uh, temple shrines, Brahma Dev, Ramji, Maruti, Shitla Devi, Uttadeshwar, and Kalika Devi. And in one forgotten corner, you have the Sati Memorial for Bubaji Naik's wife. Yeah, you can see it over here. Incidentally, Bubaji was one of those who appealed to the Peshwa for support against the Portuguese. Now you have an old picture of the eastern side of St. John the Baptist Church, much smaller than the church that you see now. It had a porch and you see this tower at the north end. Uh, the tower was uh, broken down. It was crumbling and was broken down in, in 1965 and a tower is now at this end. This is what the modern church looks like, uh, renovated in 2015 by Vikas de Lavre. The whole complex houses the school, St. John the Baptist School, Junior College, and a health center. So uh, overlooking the lake, it serves the people of Tana in various ways. The Pasi Igyari, the gazetteer records that the fire temple of Igyari was built in um, 1580. I just would like to tell you that um, in the census of 1718, the Portuguese census of 1718, I find one Parsiu mention. So there was somebody, some Parsi in Tana as early as 1718. Then you go a little further and the Marvarvanis built the Jain temple, the Sri Muni Suvra Swami Jinale. It's uh, situated in the Timbinaka area. The Jains are very, uh, uh, very, very involved in uh, a lot of charitable activities. And the current group of, especially of the young Jains works, particularly for eye donations. This is very interesting. 70% of the eye donations at the Tani Civil Hospital come from the Jains, the Jain community. Another picture of the Jain temple. Now, this is the Gate of Heaven uh, synagogue, the center of all Jewish activities. Of course, of the Beni Israelites, okay? the Indian Jews, the Jews who lived on the Konkan coast uh, throughout, built and consecrated in 1789. Sadly, because of security reasons, you have high walls and so, you know, there's a lot of security and so you can't enter very easily. But uh, it is the center of all uh, Jewish, uh, little away, very close by to the synagogue is, okay, I, yeah, I just want to say, let me go back to that, uh, to the I just want to say that um, um, the Jain, uh, the Jewish community, sorry, uh, the Jewish community of Tana is the biggest in the whole of India. There are some 5,000 Jews in the whole of India and 1,800 of those live in Tana and around. And this particular synagogue serves their, their needs. This is the Tembi Mosque. Uh, those of you uh, historians in the, on here today will remember Dr. Dawood Dalvi, uh, great historian of Tana. He has done so much work on Tana. And I was happy to have interviewed him once where he told, because he lives just behind this mosque. And he told me about, uh, a lot about this mosque. Otherwise there's very little written information. And uh, not much is known, but he said it was built by the Maimans. And these high walls you see came out in 1984 when there were terrible communal riots. And Dr. Dalvi was one of those, even with all his, his great erudition and being such a uh, known, known member of the Thani intellectual community, 
uh, they had a very tough time in 1984. Uh, and that's when you have these high walls coming up and so you can not access this mosque very easily. St. James's Church, um, inaugurated by Bishop Herber in 1825. The town of Tana was a neat and flourishing town, he says. Uh, interestingly, the people at the Gazetteer records that the people called Christians of Tana Christians, but this was called the Saheb Lok Church. So they made a distinction between the English Christian, Christians or Christianity of the English church and Christianity that I had existed for many, many centuries before that. So local people call it Saheb Lok Church. Um, yeah, very sadly, many of the heritage enthusiasts tried to get the public works department not to demolish this mansion because it was truly an example of the Maratha um, uh, mansions of Thana, but they demolished it. Uh, I have this map. Sadly, I can't remember uh, what it dates, but the little... Uh, squares that you see here will tell you just the population of, I mean, where the houses were. So you have Tana Fort here, you have Tana, the main town here, you have Chendani, as I told you here, and then you have these suburbs that are all around and everything else is fields, not anymore. Ruins of Godbandar Fort. Now I want to talk a little bit about boat building because we are on the talk, topic of maritime history. I remember talking to Dr. Arunachalam and he said, no, there can't be any boat building in Tana because you don't have a sandy shore, you don't have the workmen. And then I, I said, but I found two references to boat building in Tana. And then one day we found this wooden cruise ship being constructed at Nagla Bandar near Tana for, the, for a German businessman. So I managed to get these two pictures, this one and this one. And I picked this up from the newspapers that this 100 wooden ship was begun in 2004 and it was to be finished at Belapur, but the whole project was scrapped. So this is a modern site for shipbuilding. Not great ships like Mazagon docks and the Bombay docks, but uh, small, smaller boats. Now, gingems. What are gingems? Gingems are a checked uh, cloth, checked or striped cloth. The difference is that um, the thread, threads are dyed before they are woven. So it's, a, it's an art to have uh, uh, weave different colored threads together. Now, there are many Portuguese documents talking about the gingems of Tana. And I want to show you this picture, which is of the East Indian sari. Um, uh, here, of course, the modern saris are made of different colors. But the traditional East Indian sari would be this one, a rose pink one. You can't see the tiny checks here. Uh, they would also wear green and widows would wear blue. So this was the, uh, the sari of the local Christians of Tana. Uh, and it is checked. So I don't know whether uh, these were, we call them saris, but they have the weave that is very close to the gingems, which were widely uh, popular all over the world. Still on the topic of maritime history, no longer this, this particular sign no longer exists. I took this picture in maybe 19, 1992 or so. So Office of the Inspector of Customs. I think this whole thing is all gone now. Here is the landing place at Stendani, one of the landing spots. Here is another uh, view of Chendani. And if you can see here, what look like bolads or you know 
things to tie the boats are actually cannons that are stuck in the ground. In, in the distance, you'll see the Kalwa Bridge. And look at all the mangroves that uh, talk about the silt over creek. It's closer view. Can you see the lovely stone, stone work here? No longer because they have um, cemented up this place today. I must take a picture to make a comparison. And here you have the cannons. Uh, very close by in Chendani is a cross and mandir. Once again, uh, I said that ports are centers of civilization, where people of different communities live side by side in, in harmony. Here's another picture of another landing. Here's a fort in the background, people waiting over here. This is Kalva, that is Thana. So before the bridge came up, this was the scene that one would see uh, before 1863. This is the Kalva Bridge again. Uh, low tide at Thana Creek today. No boat sail here. I've been asking Commander Narayan if we could take a trip somehow. It would be a really... Uh, Great idea to sail down once again. And the railways. So Tana was the destination point for the first railway. Um, and this was the old station that you can see over here. Another view of the railway station. This is the bridge, the railway bridge. So no longer, this is the famous Parsik tunnel, which was the longest tunnel till very, very recently. And uh, most people would wait to go through the Parsik tunnel. It would take you a, a whole, I think, two minutes to go through this tunnel. Yeah. And uh, right five minutes before it's time, I would like to end here. These are some of the people that I have acknowledged and I am going to stop sharing my screen. Is that okay, Farouk? Yes, perfect. Thank you so I've much. Kept, I've kept to the time. <laughs> yes, you have. There are questions. Um, uh, yeah. Shall we begin with the questions? There are quite sure. a few. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, you mentioned that the Portuguese were not interested in acquiring land, but more so on trade. So in that sense, how fundamentally were they different from the English? Uh, many historians have said that the Portuguese were a seaborn empire. Brazil uh -huh. and Angola are the only, and Mozambique were the only two large tracts of territory. What did they have okay. in India? Let's look at India. Starting from Dew, yeah, in Gujarat, come down, they had Dew. They had Daman, they had Basim, they had Thana, they had Karanja, which is uh, our Uran, Uran, no, Uran, Karanja. Yep. Uh, then they had uh, a Bombay up to uh, 1661, when then the marriage treaty gave, they gave over Bombay. And that was the end, as many people felt, of the Portuguese. The day the English set view on... Uh, Bombay, that was the end of the Portuguese, uh, say many of the Portuguese. Anyway, then you go a little okay. further down the coast and you come to Chaul or Ravdanda, where they had another very, very uh, uh, big fortress there. And across the creek, you have the, on the top of the hill, you have Korlai, the fort of Korlai, or they called it Moru the Chaul. Go further down from there and you come to Goa. That was their main uh, capital and remained the capital of their whole, what they call Ishtadu de India. So Goa remains their capital. Um, further down, they had Cochin, they lost it to the Dutch. They had Sri Lanka, they lost uh, parts of Sri Lanka, they lost that to the Dutch. Then you go further east, they had Malacca. And finally, they had 
they had ports in China, Japan. They even traded with Japan. And uh, finally, um, they had Macau. So, mm-hmm. I think 1998, 1998 yes. Hong Kong, 1999. Up to 1999, they had Macau. So, uh-huh. which then Macau goes over to China. So, what right. are these? These are just dots on the map. These are not huge territories. In fact, the Provincia do North was the largest territory of the Portuguese at That's that crazy. time. It's later that they got Goa. Now, when we talk about Goa, just two weeks ago, we, I think one week ago, we had this talk on Goa. Goa uh, was actually a very, very small place, just where what is called Old Goa today. The later conquest came later. You know, so this Provincia do North, stretching from uh, Diu, Daman, Basin, Thana, Bombay, and ending at Chao was the largest territory that they had. Right. So um, the question from Bharat is: Was Thane impacted by the by the Portuguese Inquisition? And if yes, how? Uh, we don't. Uh, the court of the Inquisition was at Basin. Okay. Not Thana. I have not found. Uh, um, uh, so uh, Thana is too small a place to uh, have the court of the Inquisition. You know? Remember, when you talk about Inquisition, Inquisition, what is it? It's a court. Yeah. It's a court of law, you know, where people are brought to trial. And what were they brought to trial for? For going against uh, Christianity, their own religion. You know, we keep getting this uh, idea that uh, the Inquisition is about the atrocities towards Hindus, but in in my uh, reading, it is the Indian Christians who suffered more during the Inquisition. The Jews, they're the ones who suffered more during the Inquisition than the Hindus. So we don't have reference okay. to Tana uh, having a separate court. If there were cases from Tana, they were taken to Basin. Okay, so Stephanie wanted to know, does Thani have a horse trading connection? With I guess Gold. she's asking because of Gold Bandar. <laughs> yes, because of Gold Bandar, yes. Yeah. yeah, so it was, um, it was very... Uh, 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 and uh, uh, Marco Polo gives a great uh, description of that. Um, uh, uh, going back to 13, uh, 1290, Marco Polo talks about the horse. Uh, okay. Trade, uh, Stations. Yeah. And she also wants to know is, is ginger the same as tanasi cloth? I'm not familiar with uh, the term. So. Um, tanasi would be uh, more like taffeta. Okay. Taffeta is a little different, you know, it's silky and, and taffeta. We, when we were young, we used to have these petticoats of taffeta, you know? Yes. It's like yes. a silky, stiff silk. Yes. A ginger is more about the weave. Okay. And that's the difference. Oh, there are many, many, uh, there's a whole list. Uh, seven, just before uh, Thana fell, there was a list of the kind of cloths that went to Portugal from the uh, Goa uh, Customs House. The list is in the Goa Customs House, but they were called textiles of Thana, you know? And the list is there, the prices are there. Okay. And this goes on right up to the 20th century, till the early uh-huh. 20th century. In fact, I, I wish I had the time to talk about a little village in Thana called, it used to be called Tessileria. Now, the Tessileria comes from the word Tesser, which means to, to weave. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, it later began to be called Khattarwadi because khat, khat, uh, the Khattars are the weavers. So there's a Christian suburb and there is a Muslim suburb living side by side. The Christians wove, wove silk, the Muslims wove uh, cotton. They live side by side. Uh, I remember um, uh, uh, somebody coming to Tana and looking at the old houses. They had very, very wide balconies. Mm-hmm. And uh, the reports talk about them never weaving uh, after sundown, you know, they wove, they never wove by okay. candle. So they needed that uh-huh. light, you know, so they would sit on their wide verandas of their houses uh, and they would weave. This is up to the early 20th century. 
Now, uh, nothing, nothing, nothing. Of course, industrial, you have the industrial revolution and the British flooding this place with industrial textiles. So naturally, you won't have uh, the local textiles. Uh, they could okay. And uh, there's a lovely incident where they talk about uh, saris coming from China. You know? I see. Yeah. So the silk, the saris coming from China. And that also destroyed the silk uh, weaving trade. The okay. Industry and trade. Yeah. So where can one find the Reese Magosh fort now? Oh, it's gone. We tried very and... hard. We tried very hard. Uh, older people in the town say that they saw, they would see ruins in the creek. Okay. Yeah, no, it's, it's totally gone. We tried. It, we tried also to find the, the, port, uh, the fort that was maybe somewhere on the land. Okay. But uh, I believe that with the siltation and with the landfills, it's gone. Yeah. Um, wh what would be the origin of the word Parsik? Any, anything to do with the community? Parsi? Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Uh, moving on, there is a question which is fairly detailed, so I'm going to read it out verbatim. There is a statue of Vithal Sayana. He's a contractor from the Kamki community near the Dutta tem temple established by him in Thane. Mm -hmm. Would you have a little more information about uh, Vittal Sayana? No, no. And this must be a recent, uh, I mean, a 19th century uh, development. Okay. No, and the I... same person wants to know that he's seen a picture of something known as a Portuguese bridge near the Daisar Borovili area of Asia. Yes. Oh, which I have. demolished. A... Oh, yeah. Of that, I have recently. I, it, it was featured in the papers very, very recently. So, yeah, and there's a whole. Uh, go on, yeah. uh, the, that is there. That's that's there. No, he wants to know a little bit more. If you could give him, in, give it to uh, him in two sentences. Um, about the Daisar Bridge. Yes. Even, uh, I'm very hazy about it, but recently I've okay. read. There's been there been there's been a lot of uh, interest in that bridge, and I've Thank got you. a picture, but uh, somewhere on my okay page. okay sure. Uh, moving on, uh, did Thana contribute? Uh, the people of Thana contribute to the independence movement. Any notables that come to, uh, to your mind? By the way, <laughs> I thought we were doing maritime history and not political history. But you know what, you start that. a topic yeah. and it's but, so uh, so. Yeah. But you know something, uh, some of the, uh, 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 when Nathuram Bodse, uh, one of the meetings, when uh, they traced back to, one of these meetings were held in with the conspirators who assassinated Mahatma Gandhi, that was okay. definitely held in Thana. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Thana's, uh, uh, great, uh, there are, there are, there are several uh, uh, leaders of, uh, who joined the freedom struggle. Yes. Okay. You mentioned Saint James's Church. Ankita wanted to know if it's still active, uh, if, the, if worship still happens over there. Yes, yes, it, it does. I think it belongs to the Church of North India now. Okay. But it's there. Uh, the picture I showed you was a very recent picture. Okay. Yeah, it's still in worship, yeah. This is a fairly quest, uh, complex question. I'm sure it's going to appeal to the academician in you. I'm going to read it out verbatim. What has local interest been in learning about this history? Particularly with small territories, despite their complex histories, their past often gets subsumed by national histories. Absolutely, whoever this person is, I love you because that has been my constant grouse, you know. And as for my generations of students, they used to laugh because they all got doses of Tana's history right through somehow would tie up. Uh, uh, that is the thing. Uh, our history is just because we, we belong to a state-run education system, history is very often uh, to serve national interests. 
you know, or regional interests. So uh, it's mostly political history. Who, mm -hmm. talk, who talks about the economic history? Who talks about trade? Who talks about guilds? It is fascinating to know. And there's another little thing that maybe I forgot to mention. And, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Kulkarni from Pune has done a study on Chaul, where he said that the people who actually controlled Chaul or Revdanda were somebody called the Nagarchits. The Nagarchits. Not a political power, but they must have been an economic uh, family, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they controlled the whole town. Mm -hmm. These little towns, and I was surprised that uh, Fernand Brodel, who is this great um, economic historian, uh, he talks about uh, Indonesia and it just seemed to suit my view on Thana. Because mm -hmm. here were these small little coastal towns functioning pretty autonomously. Everyone thinks Thana was captured by the Portuguese. But uh, the Portuguese made a deal with the with the, what they call the Sheikh of Thana. In the Portuguese documents, it is X-E-Q. So I've looked at it as Sheikh. Now, whether Sheikh was a Seth or Sheikh, but he was an autonomous chief. Okay. He was an autonomous chief. He makes the deal with the Portuguese. The person who asked this question, which, uh, arose, which uh, brought forth a lot of passion from you, is Mr. Uh, is is B. R. Ferrao. Oh, thank you. And, uh, what are the sources for Maratha for the Maratha campaign against the Portuguese? Ah, uh, there are two very very there are two very very important sources. That Sastichi Bhutkan, uh, which is uh, which is uh, and uh, there are a lot of documents in the uh, Peshwa Daftar. I don't know whether Mario, are you here? Mario, is Mario here? If you can I'll just see unmute that there. particular name. No? Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Um, uh, Mario has been studying some of the Modi documents in the Peshwa Daftar. So, uh, Mario, uh, this, there's a lot in Marathi. But it would have meant, you know, going through. Yes. Ashtiti is the is the main one. All right. Yeah. No, but uh, Mario has uh, has been reading the documents in Modi, and he when he comes out with this. And the next question is, uh, what what the, was the port in Thana able to handle large vessels, say those no. coming from Portugal? Yes. As, as well yes. as Marcin did. Yes. No, uh, not many, but uh, Abe Kare sailed past in about uh, 1700 and he talks about 100 ton vessels with banners and pennants and he counted four moored at Thana. Four. So, uh, 100, up to 100 tons. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the question from Raghu is why were na Portuguese names so similar? He points out that you have uh, Salset in Goa and you have Salset here. You have Rish Magos here and you have there. Yeah, so, but, uh, by the way, Salset is not Portuguese. It's from Shashti. Shashti. Yeah. Or Sashast. Correct. You know, even in Goa as well as here. Boot. It, is, uh, it was made Salset, uh, I mean, uh, for, for easy reference for them. But uh, both. How many Mandvis do we have all over the country? We have lots. There are Thanas all over the country. There's a Thana in Goa. There are Thanas. There are many Thanas in India. There are many times you have uh, names that are repeated. So I mean, yes. I think, uh, so it's not a particularly Portuguese trait. Okay. Um, you know, the I'm... Portuguese very often, you know, they used the names that was uh, uh, they they heard. They went by what they heard. Yeah. And the last question, are there any reference? Okay. Just when I say last question, there's another one coming. Are there any references to local governing bodies during colonial times? Yes. The municipality, you mean? Of course. The civil hospital is still running in Thana. Mm -hmm. And uh, recently during the COVID times, I'll give, tell you a little story. 
So um, my maid, uh, somebody, uh, my cook, somebody, uh, her daughter-in-law's mother, you know, was detected with COVID. She went into a, a private hospital and uh, before she got her test results and she paid, I think, for those uh, two days or whatever that she was in the private hospital, she got, uh, she paid about 30 or 40,000 rupees. And then uh, through great deal of influence, uh, uh, she was moved to the civil hospital. They picked her up in an ambulance free of charge. They housed her in the civil hospital. They gave food, egg. She says egg and vegetables and very, very, you know, healthy food, milk in the night and all of that. Absolutely free of charge. And after the five days, they were bused to uh, outside Thana to Bhivanti. Uh, where there was a school that was converted into a, you know, a rehabilitation, not rehabilitation, it's like a... Um, halfway, halfway home. Kind yeah, of. you know, after you, you've recovered and your fever has left, because mm -hmm. you know how it was. I thought this was pretty marvelous and not one paisa charged. And then bust oh. back to Thana and bust okay. back to Thana. With nice. not one paisa charged. So the civil hospital, you know, we make a lot of fun of it, but uh, no, the civil hospital has been doing very, very good work over the years in Thana. Still there. So, so thanks for bringing in that contemporary angle. And I, the last question, uh, uh, can you recommend some books to read on the history of Thane was a question. Yeah. So, so far there's only uh, uh, the gazetteer will give you a, 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 quite a lot. And please remember that when we talk about the Thana Gazetteer, that is the Gazetteer of the, the Bombay Presidency, there's volume 13, parts 1 and 2, and volume 14. Okay. And uh, those of you who think that uh, Thana is only Thana town, no, this is referring to Thana district, and, it is, uh, and it's up to Bandra. So those of you who want to read up about even the history and the products of the whole of South Set, we'll have to look at this old Thana Gazetteer. So besides that, uh, you no, know, just articles here, then I've got an article on the textile trade of Thana in Indica, only the textile okay. trade. I've got another article on women in the Provincia do North, also in Indica. Mm -hmm. No, Mario is coming out. No, but Mario is not writing about Thana. Yes, we okay. should. We should start. Okay. One more question. You. One more question. There is. Yes. Do you have any document or story which says more about the cannons at Chendani? Uh, oh, they're trying. The, um, uh, um, they're trying to clean them up. I recently spoke to. Uh, very interestingly, there is an artist in Thana called Parag Tandil, you know, mm -hmm. one of the old communities. And we had a good chat the other day. You know, when you think in terms of the Kohli community, you just think that they are fisher, a fishermen. They're not. Okay. They're, mm -hmm. Because some yeah. of them owned boats, some of them were captains on boats. There were Tandil, um, uh, you know, if you have a surname Tandil, it means that he was, the ancestors were captains on boats. Correct. Yes. You know, and we just say, oh, they were uh, dealing with fish, you know. They were, and my oral histories tell me that they were trading right up to Kerala. So they would take things like industrial goods, like clocks and watches and things from Bombay. And they would bring back coconuts and rice and salt and uh, things from Kerala. So right up to Kerala, yeah. right down the coast, the boats of Thana were going up to 1970. Okay. After 1970, you have this trade, yeah? Around that. Okay, time. thank you so much, Dr. Fleur de Souza. It was a great yeah. pleasure hearing you. You juxtaposed history and you brought in culture and religion. So thanks for a great evening.